My name is Jerry Gill, and I'm interviewing Reverend Homer Noley in the Oklahoma Conference Ministry Center in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. This interview will be filed in the archives of the Oklahoma Conference of the United Methodist Church and also in the archives of the Oklahoma History Center. It will also be available online on the websites of the Oklahoma Historical Society. Homer, uh, to kind of warm us up and get started, can you give us, uh, share some personal information about yourself, about your parents, where you grew up and early formative uh, experiences? My family was uh, Choctaw. My dad spoke mostly Choctaw. In fact, uh, when we were, by the time I was born, he spoke almost only Choctaw. And my mother, uh, my mother uh, was from Quentin, Quentin, and my dad met her by running away from Chilocco Indian School and, uh, and, and not wanting to go back to his original home, which was in Broken Bow. Uh, came to Quentin and got associated with the church there. So that's where my family originated. That was our home church, our home, our home base. Uh, can you discuss a little bit about your experiences of, as, as a Native American Methodist, uh, and grow, you know, growing up? For example, what spiritual values, traditions, and worship forms did you learn in your local church that you can share with us? Community, I think, is probably the key. The key word. Well, because it was mostly a Choctaw community, and it was a, com a Choctaw church community, and uh, mostly Methodist, but not all Methodist. But never it didn't matter. It didn't matter when, they, when any of the churches had a, had a meeting of some sort. Uh, everybody was invited. Of course, Methodist church always had the biggest meetings, and uh, but that's basically our our beginning. Your, your church home then was? Uh, Middle Sandboy in uh, Quentin, Oklahoma. Well, uh, can you discuss your, your uh, later experiences? And you uh, obviously you uh, are, are uh, an ordained minister in the Methodist Church. Uh, how did that come about? I guess I guess that has to has to relate all, all the way back to that experience in uh, Middle Sandboy. Um, because I was pretty much related to the church. Now we had our Sunday school, our Sunday schools and everything, and taught by our own people. Uh, sermons were always preached by our own people, so that's pretty much what I do as as a, as a child growing up. And and uh, so when I began to think about uh, the future, high school and College and all those things. I just assumed that uh, I would, I would go grow up and pretty much grow up as a as a Choctaw and and uh, those those experiences would stay with me all, all my life, which I, in a way they have. But in a way, the those experiences have been assaulted by other experiences later later on as I entered into this. Forbes Durant was uh, was the pastor who who was the pastor when I entered the ministry. And in those days, uh, in those days, the, the conference had used the system of, of uh, local preachers. And, and to get into the local preacher system, you would, you would process through uh, the, the lay speaker, what, what we call the lay speaker system, I guess. Uh, but but it, was, it was before that because, because it was, I'm, I can't. Sorry, I can't remember what, what that was called. But the process through that, to the, and then I applied for the local preacher certificate, and uh, then from there you work towards ordination. And uh, so that, that's the process I went through. Forbes Durant uh, guided me through that. He um, he took me all around and showed me what what I would be doing when I got to be a ordained clergy and uh, he started me off by having having the uh, Methodist Choctaws in uh, in uh, one of the locations uh, that didn't have a church had them build me a build a uh, a, uh, a temporary structure so I would be initiated into the 
into the conference in the way that most of our other pastors were. And that, of course, was a was uh, was a structure that was put up with poles and covered with. Uh, sorry, I can't remember the, remember what they call those, but uh, but that's that's how I got in, involved in the in the local local ministry, local church ministry. And from there, it was just a matter of processing. And he, once again, he was the primary guide and guider. And uh, when I began to think about what I got into high school and college, he was uh, pretty much uh, my road to the, to the to the ordained ministry. Let's stop for a second. Under a brush arbor. But that's uh, we use those brush arbors quite a bit when there was when there was going to be a large crowd. Churches generally couldn't accommodate large crowds, so we oh, so we would sometimes use rather than use the brush arbor. So that's where that took place. Well, it certainly, if the minister get a chance to lead a lot of liturgy services, uh, what, what's unique and special about the Native American? Methodist Church that would be different than, than a regular church? It would have been uh, having to having to speak from the from the viewpoint of your Sunday school teachers and and your and your ministers because that's where your that's where your early church learning came from. And we didn't have the formal type of schooling in the, in the Sunday schools. We did have some, we did have Sunday schools, but the Materials that we used uh, had to be interpreted by our local, our local uh, native native preachers and, and native laypersons, and uh, and there was a there was a language difficulty because because the materials were in English, and they had to understand those things, then interpret them into into the kind of language we would understand. But Sunday schools were taught by. Our local lay lay people, and uh, most of them, in, in my day at least, most of them spoke the native language, and had to interpret them in English. It's interesting. Uh, well, can you comment a little bit on some of your leadership roles in the church? I know you've been and written a book as a historian and been active and involved, but could you share over the years some of your leadership roles you've had? Well. And that's where I'm going to have to give some credit credit to the uh, to the conference after I got into after I got into the age where I would take part in uh, United Methodist Youth Ministries uh, because we had a conference minister at conference I don't think she was a minister she was her you probably heard of her name it's Evelyn Evelyn Green is what we knew uh, I think she married later and became Evelyn Stewart. But Evelyn Green was probably one of the one of the best leaders that we had in the youth department, and uh, and you're going to have to tell me what what uh, program she came from because she was out of the she was out of, out of a national program of of United Methodist Women, and uh, they were doing youth ministries, and this was in the late '50s and '60s, and uh, and she had some excellent programs. We would meet every year at uh, Turner's Falls, and uh, and the programs were well, well designed and uh, well staffed, and eventually she had uh, developed in such a way that Native Americans began to be the staff people. So I think we need to give some credit to to her on that, but uh, that kind of leadership was very limited in the Oklahoma in admission. Uh, I really don't know whatever became of her, but, I, but uh, she was assigned from a national, one of the national uh, mission agencies. It wasn't the, it wasn't the uh, board of missions, though. And how were you, you served on the General Conference uh, uh, Commission on Archives and History, uh, and served on that. Is that is that right? Well, uh, I don't know that I was ever ever a, actually actually a member, a contributor maybe. But that's about that's about it. And most uh, most of my historical <laughs> writing has originated uh, originated when I was trying to write stuff for the uh, write uh, legislation for the general conference. 
and had to do an awful lot of research for that. So that's that's probably where I started the historical uh, writing um, because I could because I could find those consistency, and I had to find I had to look for a lot of consistency. So that's how I got started with that. Well, can you expand on that a little bit about the research you were doing for the uh, general conference? Well, we had. Uh, this was after 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 I graduated from Oklahoma City University, and uh, and I was working, in fact, with the National Native American Caucus, and that's what it was called the Native American International Caucus, and uh, and we moved t uh, towards uh, doing some stuff to change how the church was uh, administering its administering the gospel to the Native Americans and. We made a lot of recommendations, and uh, in order to make those recommendations, we had to do a lot of research, and, that, and we couldn't do it just for Oklahoma. We had to do it because it affected people, Native American people throughout the country. So that's when I got involved in a lot of travel and, and uh, collecting information, and it eventually evolved into, into my part of the legislation that was written. Is there something else? That's fine. I want to uh, change the subject a little bit. Historically, the relationship of the uh, Native American community with the Methodist Church has been at times complex and a little, uh, as you said, uh, confusing and troubling. Uh, what, uh, in your book, First White Frost, you note that there have been, quote, successful missions and also spectacular failures in efforts with Native American people. Uh, what, can we talk about the, uh, maybe in your mind, what some of the spectacular failures were? Well, some of those spectacular failures are, are, are listed as uh, just plain ministry by the regular church. I'm talking about such things as the as the removal. Now we had uh, we had a pretty good Methodist movement going on in in Mississippi among the Choctaws. I mean, <laughs> the Methodist Church did. Uh, and, and so when, when the removal started, every, all the work that the Methodist missionaries had done was affected. And so when, when the people that uh, experienced the removal, forced removal, many of them died, and, uh, and many of the leaders died. So when they got, to, got here, got to Oklahoma, it was, it was a matter of uh, restoring, restoring the church among, among the people. Because by that time the the people were very were not uh, happy about the church's role, and, uh, and they still aren't. I'm, I'm I'm not happy about the church's role in that, or a lot of other things that's taken place over the over the years. Uh, because, and I can tell you why. It's uh, simply because uh, a lot of the preparation for any change that takes place among Native Americans has been behind the closed doors. Of uh, of uh, Methodist Methodist uh, persons in, in offices like the Board of Missions, and the, after fifty three, especially after after nineteen fifty three, uh, with the Council of Churches, and all of the, uh, both board of, our Board of Missions and the Council of Churches were trying to develop Native American programs, but they were doing it without the help of Native Americans. In spite of the fact that you had, you had a large Native American population in Oklahoma, and a, and a large Native American population in the rest of the country, who were Methodist, uh, still you didn't you didn't have Native American leaders in those planning sessions. So whatever plans came out of the board, you know, general boards of the of our church and the national council, were uh, done by non-Indians. And uh, and so that that put us in a in a particular spot because then the boards would then uh, meet in in Oklahoma to tell what they decided about about uh, the Indian missions, and they would meet with uh, <laughs> with the leadership of the Oklahoma Conference and the and the Oklahoma Indian Mission Conference, 
but nobody from the local churches who would be affected by all this stuff were uh, involved. Uh, in, in, unless they unless they just asserted themselves and came to the meetings on their own, which many of them did, and uh, so so uh, uh, I think if there's any kind of a historical failure, I think that would be it. The planning up program activities for Native Americans without involving Native Americans, uh, and. Uh, oh, well, what about? Uh some people mention, particularly with some Native Americans, will talk about a failure of the church, Methodist church generally, to understand their spirituality from the Native American perspective uh, and, and how that affects their worship forms and their liturgy. Can you speak to that? I think if, if the church had, if the church leadership had, had allowed Native Americans to develop their own worship, uh, uh, worship systems through their own experiences, it would probably have been uh, suitable for for not, not only Native Americans but for the whole church because what we were uh, taught to do in seminary and Sunday school and every place else was to try to mimic mimic what the uh, European peoples had decided was the way to worship. But uh, the church hadn't got hadn't got by. I'm talking about the really early church now. In the, uh, the church hadn't got by the notion of Native, Native Americans being savage. They even use uh, use those terms sometimes. I handed a I handed a, handed a, a, a missions report to uh, our national our national division officer, uh, and I said uh, I said here's something you need to know about, and that report. Uh, you just simply stated uh, about Native Americans, they are savage savages, and you know we have to figure out programs. But that was in the very early early days. But over the, over the years, there was a lot of respect take, take, took place between Native Americans and leaders in the Oklahoma Conference and the General Board of Missions when when those leaders decided that they would come see for themselves, and and uh, and that was, that was the change I think in, in attitude. But as long as they just simply left it up to local missionaries, uh, you know, those are not good days. Well, we, we talked about some of the, quote, significant failures, but what about some of the successes that you mentioned? Can you kind of trace maybe beginning early 1800s and before removal and then after removal? What were some of the successes in missionary work in other areas? Some of the successes were were, were shown uh, actually during the during the terrible days of the removal uh, on on what uh, the Cherokees call the Trail of Tears, and I think that term has been adopted for adapted for use by for the other tribes as well. But Trail of Tears uh, that term developed uh, when uh, when Someone, someone was actually asking one of the one of the people who was on that trail of the Cherokees, and uh, so that person says, "Ask, ask, what are you talking about? What, what trail are you talking about? What movement are you talking about?" And and it was answered when the Cherokees had to leave and come to Indian territory, and the person that uh, responded was a was a Cherokee woman, and she said. She said, "Oh, you mean the, you mean the trail on which we cried." <laughs> so the so the, na uh, the name stuck, and and it was applied to every other uh, tribal tribal movement, um, but. Uh, the Methodist people uh, on the on the trail among the Cherokees, when they would when they would come to a rest for the for the evening, uh, they would call people together and do worship. And uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes some of the people would would re reject coming to to worship, 
that was put upon them by the people who were causing them such uh, such terrible suffering now. But I, I was visiting, after, after college I was visiting up in the north and in a place where I never expected to see materials about uh, the Cherokee removal. I was approached by one of the members of the of the church up there. It was not a native church. It was it was a church uh, that was trying to be developed by the local Methodist people. And uh, one of the members came over and handed me some papers. He said, he said maybe you can make use of this because I I can't I can't figure out how to do this and I can't get anybody interested. And he handed me some sheets of paper and it contained a history. Of a, of a young man who, of, of a young man who uh, came on, on the Choctaw Trail of Tears, and uh, and there was a terrible accident, and there were a number of these terrible accidents that took place during these trails, but a boat sank that was trying to, they were trying to take people across the Mississippi River, and a boat sank, and many people drowned, of course. And, and uh, but there were several youth, Choctaw youth that uh, survived. And uh, as was their practice uh, in the evening when they, uh, before they went to bed, they tried to get each other together and to have a worship service. One of the leaders of this uh, was a very young boy. He was not, he was not even a teen yet. Uh, tried to get people together, to get the youth together. And uh, this was all in this series of papers that this person handed me, and he said he said he believes that uh, that young boy was uh, was uh, one of the one of the uh, early Choctaw leaders, uh, Willis Folsom, uh, whose name you may have heard, and uh, and the, the person that handed me the paper said, I think if this is story of Willis Folsom when he was a youth. And then I've tried to research that and it's just kind of hard to do because uh, no consistent materials leading to that, but I did place him at that age uh, on, the, on the, trail, you know, the Choctaw Trail of Tears. So it could very well have been Willis Folsom. Uh, I mentioned him because he was one of the people that kept the church together, uh, together during, during the uh, during some very difficult you know, years involving the, the Civil War. He was, uh, he was obviously a fully grown adult at the time. And uh, he was a Methodist, but he would not, he would not accept uh, being made into a local preacher because if he did, he would be subject to an appointment. And he said he wanted to be an, an evangelist, and he was a good one. Traveled horseback from uh, from uh, around Idabel to uh, Mashola Toby District, which is where I came from, up around Quinton, Quinton, Oklahoma. And uh, but it was east of Quinton that he was doing his work. But uh, he uh, he is said to have been that little boy that uh, kept the youth group together during that terrible period of time. Uh, and so that just kind of spurred me on to finding other kinds of things in the history that uh, ought to inspire Native Americans to to depend upon the Creator, uh, which is which is the usual name that is given to to God. Uh, and uh, and so that's uh, that's uh, sort of where I began to get my own my own feelings about about the church and. Possibilities in the church. Oh, you, you mentioned Willis Folsom as an example of that, but would would you? Uh, what's your feeling about if someone would say was the success of the church, the use of the Native Americans as interpreters, the local pastors? Uh, would they? How effective were they when, in, in evangelism work with the Native people? Yeah. Well, the first sign of success is is the constitu constituency, and and the constants of the. And the uh, 
and the way uh, the way that uh, they stuck together in, in their ministry. And it was Willis Falsam who pretty much kept everybody together, because when his youth group met, uh, yeah, people, other people came in around to see what was going on and then to listen in to what was going on. But there were there were Christian leaders on the other other movements as well. The Creeks uh, uh, produced one of the best, uh, one of the best, greatest leaders in, uh, uh, I think, that came to Oklahoma from uh, from the east, uh, Samuel Chicote. And uh, and he was uh, not only a great leader among among the uh, in the church. He had to, he had to, he had to almost force his way to do, to be a leadership of the, in the leadership of the church because the Creeks resisted removal. And uh, and and he came he came in as as a as a leader and, and affirmed his place in the Christian faith. And uh, I don't know why there isn't a church today named after him. Maybe there is, but I don't know. I don't know if if there is. But that's that's one of the things uh, that the, it wasn't just the Native Americans that was. Wasn't just the Native Americans that was persecuted in the in the forced removal. It was the church, and and so some of our leaders were were in those forced removals, and uh, and and so you know if and that they brought Christianity and planted Christianity and and uh, the Methodist system that was developed by uh, problem developed by John Wesley. They didn't have churches when they got here. I'm just talking about the Methodists now. I don't know how the other denominations did, but the Methodists adapted a a, a means of organizing church bodies by the same way that Wesley did in in England when he was when he was shut out from the Church of England churches. He began to meet with them in the. Of course, you know the story about his preaching from his dad's. Uh, uh, Tombstone, and then and then when he was asked to preach, other, otherwise he was kept out of the churches. The established Church of England churches would not accept him, so he would preach in the fields. And and his can form congregations in living rooms of, of uh, families that attended those field services. So that so the people here, when they arrived uh, from the east, did the same thing. Uh, if there was no church, it didn't stop them. They, they made in some in some families home and, and met there as long as they had to until they got a facility put aside for them. And uh, this, in, in this case, they weren't forced into doing it. They were just they were just taking advantage of a system that worked for Wesley. And and uh, when I was in Oklahoma City University, I attended the Mary Lee Clark. Methodist Church, and uh, and uh, I discovered that the way they started was using that system, because at that at the time they started up, the, there was another uh, the only church there was Angie Smith Memorial, which is a, basically a Western tribe church, uh, but that didn't matter. I mean, they, the Choctaws and others just wanted church closer to their own way of thinking, you know. I guess so. In order to Form it. They did. They used the same method. Made it homes, and uh, until they got enough people together and built a built. A, that is, they moved into a, a church that had been vacated along the river down here. Uh, that that spot is longer no longer there, replaced by developments along the river. But uh, they moved out to West Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. But. Uh, I don't know if that over over answered the question or. Appreciate it. No, well, a couple of events I want to ask you about real quickly is what was the immediate impact and the, and the long range consequences of the uh, Civil War and Reconstruction on the, on the tribes and on, on the uh, evangelism uh, uh, missionary work. Well, the long range consequence can still be seen because uh, because there there actually are, are no records. That I know about, that uh, tell who lost their lives, which uh, Native people lost their lives during 
during the Civil War. All we can get is fragmentation, fragmentations of information. Uh, and uh, you know that the, that the conference was organized in 1844 in, uh, in, uh, among the, in the Cherokee land. But uh, also you remember that uh, in 18, 1861, the Civil War started. Which, which pretty much uh, disrupted disrupted the work of the of the conference, uh, but it didn't kill it because it, they they still they still met. Now, federal you know, federal troops were of course uh, troops that were, were from the south, and they and that included some of the Native Americans because the uh, the Choctaws were talked into. Uh, into fighting along with the Federals, as were several of the other Eastern tribes, saying that if they did so, they would protect their homelands, which which now is Oklahoma, and and uh, preserve their tribal situations. And so, uh, with that strong argument uh, and promises of what to do, what to do afterwards, uh, the the Federals uh, promised to pick up the cost of the conference. After the war, which they, which they didn't, and uh, so so we don't know all of the things that took place, or, or all of the people who lost their lives. All we know is that uh, it was reported that uh, that there were there there were there was, there was a tremendous destruction of buildings, in which including including school buildings, in which the uh, Choctaw people. Existed, and and, uh, and and tried to teach their children. All those things were were destroyed during during the war. And uh, the missionaries, the missionaries, uh, sorry to say, fled fled the country. So we don't know, and 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 that's part of the problem because everything we know about uh, early day missions among Native Americans was reported by the missionaries. That's that's a problem because. It should have been. It should have been somehow worked out so that the Native Americans could keep a record of what went on, but it was the missionaries who reported, and uh, so so when they left, well, everything was destroyed. All we all we know is what we can get out of uh, reports of uh, of uh, Native American clergy who stayed behind. Uh, in fact, some of the clergy actually joined the. Military and fought on the side of the Federals, and uh, like Samuel Chicote, Samuel Chicote rose to a high rank. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't think of what it was. I think it was like major, but it was a high rank, and uh, so McIntosh. did. Huh? William McIntosh. No. Uh, Stan Wadey was Brigadier General. Stan Wadey was yeah. He was he he rose to high rank among the Cherokees. Uh, but among the Creeks, you had people like uh, Samuel Chicota, and and uh, among the Choctaws, you had uh, you had John Page. John Page uh, rose to the rank of ma major. Uh, but uh, when all these people who were leaders and rose to high ranks in the military returned to their homelands, the church made them local preachers. And there's something wrong with how the church chooses its leadership. And uh, so, uh, so I, I, of course, the church wasn't that active anyway. Among after for a long time after after the Civil War, there's about a period of about two years in which it's almost a, a vacant spot. And that's where I'm, that's where I'm trying to work right now on this history, trying to trying to somehow find the where, where the string was broken and tie it back together. And it's turning out that people like uh, Willis Folsom uh, did the preaching, and there were there were two. There was a member of the of the Cherokee tribe, uh, a minister, and of the Creek tribe, who tried to keep uh, services going on during the Civil War. And uh, when they would report on that, they they would talk about many of the many of the congregation would be would be soldiers. And uh, Willis Willis Folsom 
uh, paid the biggest price for me because he he went he traveled from around Idabel to the Mashola Tubby District, which was up around uh, Kenta and Quentin, <coughs> by horseback. And in, the, in, the, in between times, he was trying to support his family, which is still in the war zone. <coughs> I'm sorry. And, uh, and he would support his family by raising crops. And that's right, they would, they would plant, their, plant their grain and, uh, and, he, and then he would uh, make his way back into the military and back, back into, not military, but back into his evangelistic mode. And at a certain, at, when the time came to harvest, he'd come back harvest and uh, try to get his family set up. Right, he'd go right back to, go right back to his ministry. And uh, there is a, there there is a, uh, he did keep a record of his travels, and that that can be found in the, in the uh, Methodist archives in the. Right here in Oklahoma City. And I've got a part of them, so I, so I've got, I can read that part, but he was one of those that saved the church and uh, because and and this is kind of important I think and that is because the church the Native American church did not see the white church as uh, as being consistent enough that that it would that it would it would uh, bring the whole gospel together so when so when the so when the churches were destroyed including white churches in, in the path of the Union soldiers, uh, they just assumed that they were being punished just like the white Christians were. So they didn't lose faith in the in the Christian Church, and and uh, as and as soon as things quieted down, they were back trying to trying to meet again, and meeting in the homes once again, trying to pull things back together. Uh, and uh, nobody has put together yet. At least, I've, done, I've found nobody has put together uh, any materials that told how many Native Americans died in the Civil War, where they were buried, or, uh, or anything about, about the Native American participation in the war. If you read a history of the Civil War, you won't find anything about Native Americans. Uh, it has to be, it has to, it has to be uh, intentional, and so some of the Writer, church writers then eventually did mention mention that, and uh, one of the one of the writers said that uh, and I'm going I'm to have to guess at this, but I, I, mean, I may get it wrong by a couple of points. But 33 uh, percent of the of the children of the, among among the Choctaws in a given area uh, uh, were without parents. They were. Without parents, and that means both, both mother and child, uh, died during the Civil War. Uh, another percentage was uh, was without at least one parent. So we don't know. Nobody has said how many. No, I shouldn't say it that way. I have not found any record of anybody saying that that uh, so many Native Americans died. And when I would ask about it, they would say, "Well, you got ought to check down in uh, Fort Smith, or not Fort Smith, but down in Texas, uh, Fort Worth. There's a depository in s somewhere down there uh, of the Civil War." Uh, but uh, I I could not find any information yet. Homer, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, past injustices and the history of the Native uh, American movement within our. The Methodist Church, but today uh, the current repentance and reconciliation movement within the United Methodist Church is lifting up some of those past and continuing grievances. Uh, can you explain the general intent of the movement and the desired outcomes that Native Americans have for that? Yeah, you're right that there is, there is a <clears throat> there is a movement, small as it is, to try to. Uh, Try to uh, outline those injustices and find a way to uh, recompense for those. Uh, I, I, I tried to attend one in uh, in uh, Colorado when the I think it was a, I think 
was a general conference meeting there? Or? I'm not sure, but, uh, but but anyway, somebody had put together a program and of uh, ap uh, apologizing for the for the uh, murder of uh, so many of the Native Americans by. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm my head's going now. I, I want to tell you the name of the uh, name of the person because he was a lead. He was a leader of the uh, Colorado Militia, but he was also a Methodist district superintendent. John Shivington. John Shivington. And, uh, they, and they were, there was an attempt to, to acknowledge that and, and apologize for it, but it wasn't done in a great spirit and, and it wasn't too well ex ex uh, accepted by, uh, but because that was just too great a thing to, to apologize for and then let it go, you know. It's, there's got to be more done. And uh, if you haven't read the detailed account of that, and you read it sometimes, and you'll, you'll understand why Native Americans uh, wouldn't accept that. Well, you mentioned that more, you think more needs to be done. Could you list some of the things you think need, need to be done? The church needs, the church needs to uh, disown, I mean, I mean disown by, uh, Disowned Shivington. Uh, he was, he had a he had a history of working among Native Americans. He was one of the one of the uh, ministers assigned to to preach and, and minister to the Native Americans who moved from the east to the Kansas City area. And, and uh, he was he was a preacher then. And then when uh, I I don't know how it happened all happened, but uh, but he. When he was assigned out to, out west to to Colorado, he was offered a uh, he was offered a uh, commission uh, on the a missionaries commission to to work among Native Americans, and he turned it down. And this is a matter of record. He turned it down, saying, "I want a fighting commission. I don't want a preacher's commission." And and so. Uh, uh, that led up to then the massacre that uh, that everybody knows about, but uh, nobody wants to disown. Uh, I think the general conference needs to disown disown that, and uh, wipe his wipe his name from the records of of, uh, of Methodist ministers. Uh, and I, I know that people are going to say, "Well, he wasn't the only one. There were others." And that's right. There were others uh, who did the same thing. But he's he's the only one that uh, got any acclaim for it, and became public, and uh, so I, I believe that yeah I believe that more needs to be done. I don't think I don't think a simple apology and and uh, saying we're sorry that this happened to you, something something more material is going to have to take place. Well, is is uh, Homer is part of? Uh, I'm speaking here a little bit from maybe a, a non-Native American perspective. Is part of what the, the uh, repentance, act of repentance, is asking for is not as much shame and guilt. Is that part of it, or what are they what are they requesting? Well, I don't know what they're requesting. I don't think Native Americans are a part of that. I think, uh, <clears throat> I think somewhere along along this is a uh, is a group that has, has been feeling this this in their own hearts and are trying to are trying to get something positive and positive done. And show to show that the Christian people do not accept that kind of treatment of people they're trying to minister to, and and uh, so it's it's not a Native American movement. Uh, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure how it, how it got started, but but it was. I'm sure started by some good-hearted people, and I I don't want to condemn it. Uh, but uh, but uh, and they've tried to get Native Americans to buy into it, and I think many people, many of them have. Uh, just accepting it as I'm, as I'm trying to accept it now, as a as a as a gesture of good faith. But uh, I don't think a gesture of good faith is going to go far enough to account for the atrocities that uh, that took place, because that's that's the only one that we know about. On your your point about uh, needing more than just apology, what uh, what will, from your perspective, what would the church? Uh, 
and, and non-Native Americans need to do to help bring about reconciliation in addition to just uh, attending it? I think mainly uh, some groups sitting down, sitting down and talking, but talking about you know, and, and and working it out, and then coming up with some kind of a some kind of a activity. But uh, but the problem is that when you get people together like this, one side here and Native Americans over here, they sound like they're bragging about it. And uh, we're sorry that we beat the heck out of you, you know, uh, but. Uh, they sound like they're bragging about it instead of uh, really feeling sorry for it, and so I, I think that I think that there does need to be some kind of reconciliation, but uh, not in the kind of thing that they've been trying to do. Public apologies, you know, or just don't just don't do it. The other side of that coin, what will uh, what role will Native Americans need to play in helping achieve reconciliation? Well, I think Native Americans are, are working towards it already. I mean, and they, uh, because as I said, they they never did see the church as being a part of the uh, a part of this kind of thing that Shimington did, in spite of the fact that he was a district superintendent. They did not identify him with with the church in that respect. And and so and so the what they what the what the Native Americans are doing is not. Focusing on, on those kinds of things, but focusing on what the church is supposed to be focusing on, I guess, and that is that is a reconciliation of all people. Uh, and that's maybe that's the that's part of the answer, and that is that Native Americans want to be want to be able to feel uh, accurately that we are a part of the whole people of, of the church, and that we can deal with deal with those things. Uh, on the other side, you know, that they claim that, uh, that Native Americans uh, trashed the churches on you know, a few occasions in, in, the, in the Plains areas, and I, I kind of doubt that uh, because, because of Wounded Knee, for one thing, they, the people were there, that was, a, that was a Native American spiritual experience, but, uh, but uh, the people, the white folks were living around there, thought it was a re reenactment of, of, uh, of the wars, you know, and all this sort of thing. And so they, they appealed to the government. And so who did the government send down there to, to quiet things down? The, the very same people that, uh, that were destroyed by, by the by the Sioux and Cheyenne, uh, and Arapaho, at Little Bighorn. So you, so you know they're not going to go down there and, and say, let's shake hands and be friends. Instead, they came down and slaughtered. Over, or they, say, they say it's 300, but I think it's probably closer to 500 of the other people who came to Wounded Knee for this spiritual experience. And that's what it was. It was just their, it was their annual gathering for, for spiritual experiences. Uh, but and there was nobody there at that at the time that the attack took place, except people who were preparing the grounds for, for that purpose, women and children, older older men, and uh, young people that could get to come down and, and do some of the hard work. So so when you read about that, you read about women, being, being destroyed, being killed, and many of the women, uh, hiding, digging holes in the in the deep snow, and hiding their children thinking that they would be safe there and they would come and rescue them later. That is, the women would. But the women were killed. Children were found when they were, they were searching the grounds. So I don't know how I got to that, but, uh, but the reconciliation, first of all, you have to, have to put together the, some, of the, some of the information that, that shows what has to be reconciled. And and, and uh, in this case, you almost have to look at uh, at the at, the, uh, at some of the eastern nations, the Far East, and uh, uh, like like uh, like in Jerusalem, for example. Uh, the people it said that the people were driven out of the, out of the, out of their homelands, but they came back later to restore the country. And so you can see the problems they're having restoring 
restoring the country. And uh, now the wars that they claim it's going on over there, they claim that they're religious wars, and it's not, it's not easily identifiable as religious. They, they're doing things that are not so, so faithful. I'm talking about non-Christian now. But, uh, but this church isn't so far removed from, from uh, some, of those, some of those experiences across the, across the world. I wish we were. Now in reconciliation, I don't think it's a good idea to dwell on, this, on these things. Uh, when, we, when we get together in mass meetings, we dwell instead on the, on the needs of the people of the moment. And, and the needs are still there that were there when all this, all this started up. Uh, the, lead, the need to retain, to retain uh, homelands, for example. And, and, and maybe, and maybe you, all, you all know the answers to these, these concerns that I have, and that is uh, they're associated with each local church. There are two kinds of properties. One is a one-acre tract, which, which is where the churches are usually located, and the rest of it is a large acreage, 150 or so acres, even larger, uh, that belongs that uh, associated with this church. Who has title to that large acreage of land? It should be the uh, Native, Native American people who who make up the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. But my guess is, is that it's not. Uh, my home church was put up for sale uh, about f six years ago, and my brother. My brother bought it. I, I didn't have enough money to buy, buy it myself, so I said, to, "I said to him, I said, I, I would like to buy this property, but, but I don't have, I don't have the money." He said, "Well, that's that's where I was born. That's true. The four of us, let's see, one, two, three, three of us were born on those church grounds, in 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 one of the camp houses." And so he said, "Well, that's, that's my place of birth." So I'm, I said, so he said, "I'll get the money and I'll I'll buy that property." So he, he, he did, all except one acre of land. And I'm still going to find out how come that he was not able to buy that. Uh, but, uh, but our family still has the over that land now. We own the land that he was able to purchase. Who owns that one acre? And, and uh, it, it's, 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 it's reversed in other parts of the country. One acre of land is where the church is. Who owns the large acreage out there, which the church uses? And and uh, I think questions like that are going to have to be answered. Uh, so we have more issues than than uh, Shivington and and uh, those that we can easily identify. We got some present issues, some current issues to to, to deal with, uh, and uh, that's the relationship. One of those is the relationship between the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference and the Oklahoma Annual Conference. Uh, I, I was on the staff, as you know, of the Board of Global Ministries uh, for a few years, just just under five years, and uh, learned a little bit about the churches administering of of the uh, churches. I don't want to go into that now because I don't want to have to do a lot of explaining for it, but. Uh, I do know that the national church has something to say about what goes on on the land issue, and and I believe that that needs to be settled a little better than a little quicker than the Shivington issue, uh, because that's something that is within the power of both the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference and the broader Oklahoma Conference to settle. This this whole town is on Indian land. I don't know at what point they paid for it, or if they just took it. My understanding is, is if they just took it. Picking up on some of your conversations about the churches, what, in your opinion, is the current status and, and future prospects for uh, the churches in OINC? Well, it's hard to you have to ask, ask somebody who is engaged daily in their in in their work. Uh, 
conference office, I guess, and some of the pastors, and and many of the you're going to find a lot of concerned people who will say kinds of things that I'm saying, but who will say them with a greater authority. Uh, and uh, I think that that issue, is, the land issue, is one that has to be resolved. Uh, I, I could tell you some stories about uh, some of those issues, but I, I don't want to ruin your report here. But, uh, but I think that they can identify the kinds of things, the kinds of things that need to be dealt with. But many people don't want to don't want to cause problems, or as they as they, as they would say, uh, they would prefer to work at a, at a level where cooperation is, not down here where the where the problems are. But uh, yeah, I, I would say I would say deal with them, and I I even have a suggestion as to how to how to go about that. I would think that. Uh, I don't think this kind of a conversation ought to be held in in selected local churches that have that have expressed some things. And I think there are a number of churches, local Native American churches, that uh, have expressed some of these things, but they don't know. They don't want to push the issue because because they, they're not Native American Christians are are. Uh, they don't want to ruin the Christian, the Christian image of good nature and cooperation and all that. So they don't want to deal with some of these hard issues. But you got, you do have some people who will, who will deal, deal with some of these, some of these issues. This church has the Indian Mission Conference has, has sent uh, missionary, missionary, not missionaries, has sent leaders to many conferences in the country. Harry Long, you probably have heard of. He, and, and the entire Long family, they've, they've sent people out. There's, uh, there's one located who's just now, I think, working on his ministerial orders in uh, Arizona. Uh, he's, he's a Long. And the uh, Long family came from uh, Salt Creek. And, and, they've, and they're kind of concerned about uh, the future of the... Well, the culture, I think, is is one thing, uh, and I think that uh, I think that acceptance of uh, uh, one's own back, uh, background and one's own culture or background is just as important to Native Americans as it is to Englishmen, Germans, and uh, Europe, other Europeans. Uh, but every every time you talk about uh, uh, building the church among Native Americans, you talk about uh, removing them from the culture. I don't care. I don't care when you talk about it. That's that's what that's what they talk about. Removing Native Americans from the culture as if there's something wrong with Native American culture. And what what's wrong with it is that uh, what what they perceive as being wrong with it is that they're not able to to communicate within the concepts of the Native American cultures, but they would and they could if they would. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to think, think of some. It's like I told you about the about the Sunday school materials. Some of the early early missionaries that were who were not Methodist translated translated the uh, you know, Bible into the language of the people they were serving. Uh, I think I think that was done in, in Mississippi by some of the um, uh, missionaries from the American Board of American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. Uh, so there's there's no reason why the why the various cultures could not make make some kind of some kind of cultural contribution. Uh, and uh, one of the reports that I, I was going to read for you, but I don't think I will now. But because it, but uh, because it's it's one of those reports that was put together in a meeting, in nas in national meeting, of. Uh, 
people in the in the in the boards of the various churches, like Methodist and congregational churches, uh, council of churches, in other words. But uh, they, there was a report sent to them, and one of the reports came from here. And somebody asked the person who was presenting the report for the Native Americans. Obviously, it wasn't a Native, was not a Native American. It was it was one of the mission leaders, white mission leaders. And his answer was, his answer to the question of what, what's going to happen to the Indian missions, his answer was, there will always be Indian missions as long as there is a language and economical and a civic issue. And that's uh, politics and money and a way of thinking. And, uh, and uh, the church has historically worked hand in hand with federal government on especially one issue, and that is to transport people out of their culture and put them into the broader culture, as if that's going to save their lives, you know. And in, in, a, in a way, I guess it would, but uh, but uh, why would people have to give up their culture in order to in order to uh, accept Christianity? Same thing was being said to same thing was being said to the uh, People, if you, if you want to, if you want to read about in the Bible about what's happen, what's happening to Native Americans or what happened to Native Americans, then uh, you ought to read the entire Book of Acts. That that should be the Bible for the for Native American churches, uh, because all the issues that we're talking about here now was dealt with there. The language was one, and and I think if there was a, a wrong interpretation of of missions and and language. Uh, you remember the, you remember the, uh, the conversation that was going on between Paul and uh, and uh, some people who were who they had brought into the church from the from the various nations that they that they went to, and one of the one of the uh, I'm sorry I'm sorry one of the one of the uh, people who uh, one of the people who uh, heard that. Uh, Cried out, and he was happy. You know, he said, "He said, how is it that we can hear, you know, we can hear the you know, the message of salvation in our own tongue?" Now, now that's that's the biblical word for language. But uh, but the church hasn't used it in that way, and and, and uh, so and uh, so Paul, if, we, if you read further. You'll understand, or read, read, I'll read the life of Paul somewhere. They'll tell you that Paul spoke about five, five languages that that were involved in the people that he ministered to, and he required. That's why he was choosing the people that he sent into the ministry among among the among the other uh, the non-Jewish people. He required them to to speak at least one of the languages of the people that he was going among. Because he uh, and somebody said somewhere else uh, that he spoke, he himself spoke five languages. So that's why it was po possible for them to explain, exclaim, "How can we hear the Lord's word in our own language uh, from Jewish people?" You know. Well, uh, you, you take a look at our at at, at some of the. Uh, it's some of the papers from from reports to the two mission boards, and uh, like the one I just named here, uh, and uh, they're saying the same thing, it's the lang language. Now, I when I was in, o in Oklahoma City University, I used to like to go to school to ch church at uh, one of the local churches because I knew I'd be able to hear hear the, the message spoken in different languages. But I went one time to. To the church, uh, uh, and to one of the churches, and, I, and they, we were planning the Christmas program. I said, "Why don't we do the Christmas program by starting with an evangelistic <coughs> series of programs, and then winding up with Christmas service?" And and the, during the evangelistic programs, each preacher get a, pre a different preacher each each night speaking in one of the 
languages of the people of the congregation. And suddenly there was silence. And I said, <laughs> and I sat there and he's um, afraid I said something wrong. But one, finally one, one person spoke up and said quietly, we don't use the language anymore. Now that was a very sad thing for me to hear. <clears throat> but I didn't realize that it was a policy of the church and a policy of the federal government that uh, everybody was supposed to speak English. Appreciate it. You've uh, enlightened us on a lot of different areas, and, and good luck in your continued research. <laughs>